Short dance because uh, this is a long form interview and people want to get to it. People want to hear him. You can follow him on the Twitter. You know him on YouTube. Stefan Molyneux, Free Domain Radio is what the channel is on YouTube. But he has a new book out. Show, show that uh, that book for people uh, who haven't seen. There you go. It is The Art of the Argument. So Stefan Molyneux and I will be talking here today. Full show. Before you people complain, where are the photos? And if we don't do a full long form show with a guest, they, people also complain sometimes. But uh, thank you for being here, sir. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, I also wanted to thank you for the blurb and just remind people that the full name is The Art of the Argument, Western Civilization's Last Stand, and you can find it at theartoftheargument.com. We got audiobook coming up. We got Kindle. We got print. We got everything. We'll get it tattooed on your forehead. It's obviously going to be a fairly small font, but it can work. <laughs> yeah, well, once I get past the uh, the colon on most of these titles, I can't remember all of them. I just I, I want to get the, the general concept of the book in and then i figure the author will know better hey um are you going to read the audiobook yourself uh yes i already have so what is this accent i've always wondered because it's kind of a cross i know you're raised in canada but it's like this amalgamation of it it, it almost if you listen it, it could sound partially south african it kind of sounds english and canadian what, what created this before we get to the actual substance of the book well, it's a number of things. So first, I was born in Ireland, but lived there for very, a very short amount of time. And then I grew up in England till I was 11. I visited, my father lived in, in South Africa, visited there. I came to Canada, uh, went back to South Africa for a little while. And of course, the challenge is as well, if you don't have a cool British accent, your sexual market value depends on you. Yes. And so clearly, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to take that approach. So tried to milk the accent for all I could. <laughs> Uh, and then what happened was I went to the National Theater School, and if I just didn't want to do Shakespeare for the rest of my life, I needed to find a way to drop the accent, so I tried to take it out back and shoot it in the neck. Uh, that had sort of various uh, degrees of success, and basically I just gave up and let the language work for itself, but it is a bit of a tour of the colony's accent. It's kind of tough to nail down, and it does drive people rather mad when they try and figure out what the hell's going on. There you, well, I actually, I didn't know all those things, but I knew it wasn't Canadian, and the, the good thing is any accent is better for picking up chicks than the Canadian accent states at any well, accent. Well, Southern accent? Yeah, Southern accent, If you, because you can do the Matthew McConaughey kind of make it a little sexy. Oh, there's, the droll. There's thing. nothing yeah, sexy about right. the maritime sound when you're out there in the States. Um, so, I'm, I'm too lazy to rise above a vocal fry. Yes. Okay, yeah. Although they'll never believe them if they come up with some sort of like disease cure. No one believes someone with a Southern accent. Well, you can kind of be charming, but we're not trusting you with any medical advancements. No, really, I'm a physicist. Yes. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. You don't. I figured don't I had to go to play. Um, all right, so Stefan Molyneux, Art of the Argument. Now, is this the title? Has this been the working title for a long time? Because obviously Art of the Deal, is it a, is it a play on that, or they just happen to have the same? It was just sort of an inspiration based on that. And, you know, I've been debating with people since I was a, a little kid. I was on the debating team. Uh, I was uh, the fifth best debater in Canada the first mm. year I tried it and really, really enjoyed it. And I don't know, I guess you go through, at least I went through a whole series of maybe if I just have better information, maybe if I just have better arguments, maybe if I just have better analogies, I can actually work to change people's minds. But as you try that in the world, as you've tried, as I tried and well, with some success, but I think I just finally came down to the idea that I'm not sure that people really know what an argument is. I'm not sure they really know how important it is. And I'm not sure. In fact, I'm fairly sure they really don't know how to do it, which is a shame because when we're kids, all we do is argue. You know, right. we argue with our friends, we argue with our parents, we argue with our teachers. If they'll let us, we we argue just about everything, which is great. It's how you sharpen your verbal wits and have an influence in the world that's peaceful and positive. But man, does that ever get scrubbed out of us over the course of our childhood, and particularly, I think, when you get into uh, you know high school and, and college. Well, I think, and you talk about this in your book. I think that's because an argument is, is is misconstrued. It's somehow seen as impolite when that's not actually what an argument is. So you sort of your quotes have become meme of that's not an argument. I'm sure you know about that. So for the audience, give us give us sort of a briefing. What is an argument? I know you define it in the book. So everyone out there, if you feel as though this is informative, don't say, ah, I got the cliff notes. Go buy the book. But let's introduce them. What is an argument? Fine. All right. You, <laughs> page one. Okay, no. Um, so what an argument is when you try to change someone's mind with reason and evidence. Right. And 
that really, you know, they, you think that's impolite. Boy, you should see the alternatives. It's like arcing piss bottles and it's like spears going into the sides of horses and it's like setting fire to Baltimore. I mean, yeah. the, the alternative to the argument is worse than anything you can conceive of. You know, we emerged from this primitive head clubbing, head clubbing society 2,500 years ago. We got the Socratic method and we've been battling between, you know, violence and reason ever since. And right now, I think we're teetering a little bit on the brink and the goal of course is try and tip it in the favor of the argument because that's where civilization really resides have you been reading about when you did your research on this book because we've written about this on the website have you been reading about how the socratic method depending on the university is seen as discriminatory some schools actually obviously because it's been replaced with different types of liberation theologies insert blank liberation theology here but uh, I, I was surprised because i never learned it in in, in university uh, I never learned Socratic method. I had to learn it on my own. There were a lot of things that I didn't learn in school. Uh, it seems now you, as though you should be learning that in like grade four. You should be learning that in grade three. I mean, as a as a father, you know, my my daughter is incredibly logical and is able to pinpoint with like laser accuracy when I'm making a slightly inconsistent statement. It's like, oh, father, you said something quite contradictory to this. Whoa, not seven and a half months ago by my childlike calendar, and therefore your argument is annulled, sir. I say annulled. <laughs> she's wearing a just a judge wig up to the kids' table. <laughs> Nay, <laughs> she's quite mature. So, I mean, I think we're naturally born. Uh, to to argue and to debate and go back and forth and and you know you, you get a bunch of kids after Halloween you sit them around a table and you watch them wheel and deal and negotiate back and forth again about who gets what candy and so on I mean it's like watching a bunch of barkers on speed it's incredible yeah and this really gets scrubbed out of us to the point where we all want to have an effect on the world we all want to change the world to the better or at least according to our own ideology how are we going to go about doing it well we can run to the government and we can say pass a damn law suppress these people you know we can call up advertisers and say well, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't advertise with these people because they're terrible. We can throw bricks at people. We can, uh, you know, try and get people delisted from their websites and so on. But I think we really do want to have reason and evidence. And the idea that it's somehow related to gender or race, it's just another way to, to um, divide us. I mean, reason yeah. and evidence are universal across the planet, across humanity and so on. And the idea that somehow, you know, it's white privilege to be rational, that's kind of an insult to everyone else uh, and not much of a compliment to white people. Yeah, well, we were talking about this when we did our, our, uh, our I guess you'd call it, I don't know, undercover investigative work in Houston. It's, it's this peer pressure straw man. It's this outrage Ponzi scheme from the left. And that's why they want to silence dialogue. That's where they say, well, gay people are offended. Black people are offended. And the truth is the people most marginalizing these groups are the leftists. They're the ones who are marginalizing them. I watched my friend Owen Benjamin do stand-up recently, and he has some racially tinged humor, and uh, the people laughing the hardest were black people in the audience. Because it wasn't mean-spirited, it seems as though offense and, and taking a f affront to an argument is very much conditioned. They say racism is conditioned. People don't hate people just based on the color of skin. That's absolutely true, just as far as melanin and skin. If you look at that tweet from Barack Obama, which I'm like, well, okay, I see it too. A black kid and white kid playing together. What, what, how is this news? But this idea of taking offense to an argument is very much conditioned, and it's liberals doing that. You weren't always, uh, I guess, sort of right wing, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you talk a lot about moral relativism and absolutism. Kind of define the difference for us, and, and did that play a part maybe in, in, in your transition, certainly in becoming more active politically? Well, yeah, I mean, the, um, the left since we happen to be talking about them, the left <laughs> continually says, you know, there's no such thing as truth, everything is relative and so on, which, of course, if you take that at face value, and I've known a few of these horror slash freak shows of soulless people in my life who say everything is relative, there's no such thing as truth, there's no such thing as virtue, so then shut up about it. You know, that would be the thing. Right. You know, like, Middle Earth doesn't exist, so I'm not going to start up a travel agency to get you there. It's like, there's no such thing as truth, then shut up. There's no such thing as virtue, then shut up. If there's no such thing as virtue, there's no such thing as truth, then there should be no such thing as racism. There should be no such thing as, as you know, right or wrong behavior in any context. No such thing as sexism. No such thing as a negative power disparity or anything. But they say, well, there's no truth, there's no reason, there's no evidence, there's no logic, there's no virtue. But let me instruct you, 
as a violent micromanager exactly how to live your life in conformity with my ideology. It's like, well, you've got to pick one, man. I mean, right. you just got to pick one or the other. But they, of course, want all the benefits of relativism, which means you don't have to define your own position with all the benefits of moralizing, which means you get to finger wag at others. Yes. I mean, this, this is a group of people, not Gay Jared, every now and then he stumbles across a brilliant point. He said they would have all nonviolent drug offenders out of jail, but people who use the word fag in maximum security prisons. Now, I'm not saying that nonviolent drug offenders should be in jail, but I'm saying at some point they draw a line, and for them, it's hate speech. You'd need to be jailed for hate speech, uh, but if you're dealing crack, eh, we'll give you a pass. At some point, there has to be a judgment call. So let, let's kind of walk through, because you coach people in this book. You teach them how to make arguments, how to form arguments. Before we kind of get into some examples, because I know you're very good at this, what would you say is most important for people to know when they are framing an argument? Well, there is the fundamental question of what is your argument for and, and who is its intended audience. So, I mean, if you're just debating with someone on the internet, that's not quite as important. If you're a more, more public facing person, I think it's, uh, it's important. Know why it's important to you. You know, the, the first commandment of Socrates was know thyself. Know why something's important to you. Know why you care about something. Because if you're emotionally triggered, man, it's really hard to make a cohesive and rational argument. And it is so easy to fly off the handle and get offended. Understand why it's important for the other person. You know, why are we even having this debate? What does it even matter? Otherwise, you know, it's kind of this random shadow punching that's right. designed to mask an emotional investment rather than the pursuit of reason itself. So I think that self-knowledge is really important. Now, once you've got that, squared away, you need to know that your argument is rational. You need to know what, is the, what are the principles behind it? What, what is the evidence that supports it? And you have to strenuously avoid imposing conclusions on people. You know, when you just when you say, white privilege, racism, sexism, this is all, these are all just conclusions. They're just designed to bludge you, uh, uh, bludgeon you into submission. You've got to build the case up slowly. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't be a very good lawyer if you, you know, you, you jump into courtroom and just scream guilty, 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 guilty over and over again. Yes. Or the other guys, innocent, innocent, innocent. It's like you've got to build the case. You've got to call your witnesses. You've got to present your evidence. You've got to build the case. If you build the case slowly and carefully, getting agreement every step of the way, the conclusion should be reached by your audience almost before you provide it to them. And when they own that conclusion, having followed your reasoning process, they're much more likely to stick with it. You can sort of browbeat someone into compliance in the moment, but you know it's just like holding a balloon underwater. You let go, walk away, up it comes. Right. So well, j just on that note, before we get into some examples, because like you said, white privilege, this idea of, of, I don't know, patriarchy, these are conclusions. Is it an exercise in futility to argue with somebody who is using those conclusions as arguments themselves? Do you need to just recognize, all right, there's, there, there's no reason to try and argue this because they're just hitting me with a conclusion. This isn't going anywhere. I, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and there are certainly times when that is the case. I view most of the people who are making bad arguments in society at the moment, uh, Steve, as uh, ignorant, not malevolent. Yes. You know, there is there's an old I don't go as far as there's an old argument uh, out of ancient Greek philosophy, which says that all evil is a form of ignorance, that if they just if evil people knew um, how good benefited them and how evil harms them and so on, that they would become good people. I don't go that far. I think there are genuinely malevolent souls in the world. But I view most people as um, as misguided. They've been badly informed. They've been programmed by a bunch of power hungry sophists. Uh, they have been kind of set up as attack dogs on anyone who raises relevant questions. And, you know, forgive them father, as the saying goes, they know not what they do. So uh, to me, if someone starts jumping at me with conclusions, it's like, okay, well, let's step back and tell me how you got there. Where was the where does the argument start from? And how do you deal with this contradictory uh, information and so on? You know, the old Donald Trump is a fascist. You know, if he was a real fascist, you'd be in jail already. Yes. <laughs> you know, the fact that you can call him a fascist, how do you square that with the idea that he's supposedly this fascist? Also, yeah. what is fascism? How do you define it? How is it distinguished from uh, the, free, the free market? How is it distinguished from communism or socialism or a mixed economy? And very quickly you'll find out, this is again back to Socrates who uh, questioned all of the supposedly wise people of his day and found that they really didn't know anything. They just pretended to know stuff. And most people are out there, you know, thumping their chests and hurling these language bombs at people. They really don't know what they're doing, which is one thing, but they don't even know that they don't know what they're doing. And when you point that out to people, some people will escalate, but some people will be like, huh, I guess I thought that was true, but I'm not sure I really have the argument down pat. What a wonderful opportunity 
to engage in a productive dialogue. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, talking about how there, there are some truly malevolent souls, but it's generally not the rule. I've always talked about this, how there are people, like you said, who are ignorant, and there are people who are so dead set in their ways, it doesn't matter. That's why when I interviewed someone in Hawaii, his name was Will Corona, I said, listen, what if I could pro provide you with, let's say, five sources we both agreed upon that an $18 minimum wage or a universal basic income of $1,500 a month has negative ramifications on the lower class and middle class. If I could provide you with irrefutable evidence, would you look at the other side? And he said, you know what, yeah, I would. I asked someone else that same question, they said, well, I would figure out how to make it work. And so sometimes you've got to uh, recognize, okay, this is someone whose mind can be changed, that's your audience. Someone whose mind cannot, the audience is the people who might see this argument. It's the actual audience of the argument. And I think you do a good job of recognizing the difference there. So, okay, let's pick, uh, I don't know if you have a specific topic that you would like to pick to go through an example. Do you have one that you want to, because I, I, I actually- could. I'm, I'm happy to, if you've got an argument that keeps arising uh, in your mind or in your interactions with people, I'm happy to look at that as well. You know what? I'm not very good at this. This is it's. I did a, a public speaking, uh, a persuasive, I guess, persuasive essay, but in public speaking. So I don't know if you call that an persuasive oral. I'm not exactly what sure what it was. But in Canada, they had these international competitions, and I just happened to do it in my class. And then I was ranked top in the province. I didn't even know until after it happened, and they put me down. And it was actually about Quebec's awful film rating system. Everything. I don't know if you remember. Well, you're from on. You were in Ontario, and Quebec. Every Everything was PG-13, everything was uh, G, unless there was a single gunshot, then it was PG-16. So Jerry Maguire, G. Dangerous Minds, G. Like, you could basically see porn, and it was G. It would come in and be G, and then all of a sudden, it would be an action film that was PG-13 in the States, and it was PG-16. I did an oral on that, and then they asked me to join the debate club. And uh, I said, well, yeah, sure. And I left immediately when I was told that I had to argue things I didn't believe in. I wasn't very good at it. And I know that's, that's, a, that's a skill that's learned in debate. But I said, I, I, I don't really have time for this, especially in Quebec, because I had to argue right off the bat for third trimester abortions for, I was like, ah, no. Okay, so I'm not oh, very- But come on, if you're a sports team, don't you study the other team's plays obsessively to figure out what they're doing? I, I do, but I don't know that I can- I guess because I don't believe it, and because we work mm. in this, and I like to think there's, there's, um, I like to think this show is based on sincerity. I feel like people can smell it on you. So mm. forgive me if I don't do a very convincing job from the opposition. Um, mm. I, you know, obviously, a I'm big sorry, one, and I just wanted to point out, like as a mental exercise, it's a great idea, but you wouldn't want people to think that's your real position. You could say, you know, devil's advocate position, right. where I'm arguing the other position, and so on. But you don't want people, like, if you're really, really good at advocating for a position that you don't believe in. Uh, people get a little goose, like, whoa, hang on a second. Yeah. He's just really good at this stuff and uh, has no fixed positions if he can. So I think it's good to do that publicly to show that you can understand the mind of an opponent, but you wouldn't want people to mistake that for your real position. Okay, how about one here then that's, that's nuanced, the Confederate statues? That's one that we've been running into a lot. And I can, I can see some uh, different perspectives on it. Obviously, I have my own opinions, but all right. So do you want to start this off or should I just uh, let you know that I think you're an idiot because and begin argument? Okay, so there's a number of different ways you can approach this argument to do with the uh, Confederate statues. One of the more libertarian arguments would be to say that the problem is that these are all public spaces and publicly funded statues. You know, there's yeah. a statue in uh, Seattle of Lenin, and my understanding is it's on private property. Well, hold on, so you're, make, you're making you... the argument on the other side. Let me do the bad argument. Yeah. Let me, let me do the argument on the other side. All right, Stefan, hey, listen, Antifa has to tear down. These statues need to be all torn down because, listen, there are black people in the United States. To them, these statues, Robert E. Lee, represent a, a losing side of American history who uh, supported slavery. And since there are taxpayer dollars at play, we cannot place these in public spaces that might honor these figures. How could you be against that, Stefan Molyneux? Okay, so this is the point. Now, when... You are faced with an argument, the initial impulse for most people is to rush right down into the thickets and start debating about this particular issue. Right. That is not philosophical and that is gonna be very destructive for right. society in the long run as a whole. What you need to do is say, okay, let's forget about the specific content of what is being talked about and let's extract it to a principle. So then I would say, so what is the principle at play? Is the principle at play here? that if you find something offensive, it should be removed from your site. 
No, it's, I'm not saying if something is merely offensive, but when we are using public spaces as places of honor of American history, it is not conducive toward moving forward uh, progressively in the United States to creating a better history for the future by honoring people who supported uh, barbaric practices like slavery and by honoring people who fought against right now these free United States who ended up winning. Right. So then the question is, is it necessarily that the statues imply an advocacy or an honor of slavery, or are they merely important historical figures whose presence we need to be reminded of? I mean, I don't think there are any inscriptions that say, this guy was horrible, he beat his slaves, and that's the very best thing you could possibly hope for in a society. If we're going to have a principle called anything which, according to current moral standards in the past, didn't meet those moral standards, we should erase it. I'm curious what part of history you would retain. So for instance, Martin Luther King Jr., fantastic preacher, very passionate man, fought in the civil rights movement, severely and significantly and deeply opposed gay marriage. Now, this was not unusual for him in the day. There has been an evolution in some ways uh, of acceptance of homosexual practices in Western society. Should we then go back and say, well, according to current standards, he's uh, homophobic and therefore he must be erased from history. How is it we're going to possibly end up with any history? Because then what happens is every moral advancement erases everything that came before it, and we end up as a tree with no roots whatsoever. Playing devil's advocate here for people who are tuning in late. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, no, I don't think that that's necessarily a fair comparison because Martin Luther King was not recognized for his uh, opposition to same-sex marriage. He was recognized for his uh, being, a, you know, being obviously a pioneer in the civil rights era of the United States, which I think most people would agree is productive. These statues that we are talking about, these people are mainly known for fighting in battle for the side that fought for slavery, who fought for the Confederacy. And I think that at the very least, we should um, certainly, as it relates to taxpayer dollars, take them out of public parks where people might find them very offensive that could directly be an affront to black Americans who have a very different history and put them in their appropriate places in museums. So I'm not saying let's get rid of them completely. I just don't think that it's necessarily appropriate considering what they were uh, most known historically for. So there's a couple of points there. The first thing is that it's still highly debatable whether the Civil War was directly around slavery, <laughs> right? There's lots of people who make very strong arguments with a lot of supporting evidence that say that the, uh, the uh, secession of the South had a lot more to do with the perceived Federalist tyranny of Lincoln and the imposition of brutal taxation uh, on the South and the feeling that the uh, Union was not providing the South anywhere close to what it was taking out of the South. So there's no specific conclusion around that, and this is why the debate needs to be uh, kept alive. I think that's one important point. We want to make sure that we keep these things around so that we continue to have these debates and further examine and explore the history uh, of America and what makes America America uh, in the present. So that's one thing that I would say. The second thing that I would say is that I don't think it's possible for any one individual to speak for an entire community. So, for instance, there are many studies which show that the majority of black people support having these statues uh, remain around as part of the history, as part of the legacy, as a reminder sometimes of how bad history can go and a way of making sure that it, nothing gets repeated in the same way again. So the idea that there are a few blacks who get very upset and offended by this should, again, we get back to this point in principle, should people's offense be enough to remove history from people's sight? Well, I think particularly we're not talking about removing them from people's sight. We're talking devil's advocate. We're talking about putting them into museums where it might be more appropriate, so that we are very clear. You know, for example, we have uh, Nazi paraphernalia in museums. We don't put them up in public parks. We want to make sure that this is put in an appropriate place where people can study it for history, but also study it for the stain that it was in American history. And I understand that maybe we, perhaps we can find some common ground here, where there were many in the Confederacy, uh, including some black people who fought for the Confederacy, who were not necessarily fighting for slavery, but they were fighting for, as you talk about it, states' rights, um, a, a different view of sort of a, maybe a Hamiltonian approach to the United States government. However, at the end of the day, it still does go back to the, the, the Constitution. It still does go back to liberty, to not being able to own somebody else as a human being. And whether all supported that or not, the Confederacy, it was a part of their battle to ensure that they maintained that right to subjugate another human being. I think we all would have to agree that that would have been a very different uh, fabric for America, a toxic fabric, and maybe we can find common ground where we say, okay, let's allow the monuments of people who fought for the Confederacy 
but were expressly against slavery, let's exclude those, uh, perhaps we could agree on removing statues of people who actively supported the continued practice of slavery. So then the argument is that uh, people who uh, actively supported slavery should be removed from public view and should be placed in some sort of paywall, basically. <laughs> when you've got a, you've got a, um, uh, a, uh, uh, a museum, which people have to pay usually to, to go in to see. So it's kind of out of sight, uh, out of mind. Now, the question, of course, around slavery is very complicated as part of as sort of as it relates to American history. Number one, of course, is that only like four or five percent of Southerners actually owned slaves. The vast majority of Southerners really, really disliked the practice of slavery. The the poor whites and poor blacks, of course, those who had freed, the poor whites really hated slavery because it drove down the price of labor. It was, in a sense, you know, a, a very extreme form of illegal, or I guess in this case, legal immigration to drive down wages. So they really disliked that. Also, of course, uh, Southern whites uh, were conscripted, like forced into slave hunting gangs. They had to give up like, uh, you know, a couple of nights a month or sometimes even more to trudge around the wilderness looking for escaped slaves. So they disliked it uh, enormously. There were a number of, you know, the very first slave owner in the South was a black man. And there were a number of uh, blacks who owned slaves. And it wasn't just because they were owning family members who had been freed. There was, of course, a robust practice of slave ownership. This complexity is something that needs to be discussed and needs to be talked about. And if you scrub the history uh, of a country away because of a one-dimensional interpretation of what those statues mean, you diminish a robust examination of the past that is necessary to develop a nuance of how the country got to where it got to. And of course, it was successful. It was successful. The, the fight to end slavery uh, around the world was achieved in the 19th century by the British Empire, by, by uh, Lincoln and others. And so I don't know that we should necessarily get rid of all of uh, that history and, and move it behind a paywall. We need to have it back out there so that people can have these kinds of discussions and recognize that it's not simple, I hate to say it, black, a simple black and white issue. Stephen Molyneux, are you a racist? No, hold on, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want a method <laughs> act here. Uh, well, okay, so let me understand this, that your premise is that it's productive for these to be on public display, for people to have discussions. Uh, what if I were to present the idea that, let's say in a city where this, was, this is a, a monument to a very insidious slave owner, who this was uh, one of his main purposes in the, the Civil War. He actively fought for slavery. It was clear it was well known. And if there were a vote, if there were statistics that would reflect that black people felt very uncomfortable felt uh, very much as though this was a symbol of oppression. Um, if our goal, as you say, is to have these conversations, is there a certain point where it actually uh, creates toxicity and we could agree there are instances where something should be done? Well, I mean, I hate to pull out the old slippery slope argument, but I'm afraid it does really apply here. So if there's some guy, as you point out, you know, he was pro-slavery, he owned slaves, he was a bad guy all around, well, that's part of the history of the country. That's part of the history of the environment. And again, that provokes discussions about, you know, how far America has come, how maybe how far it still has to go in terms of being race neutral and its laws and attitudes and so on. But that is part of the history. Obviously, the guy is not going to come back to life and kidnap a bunch of people and stuff them in the back of his metal carriage or anything like that. So there's no particular threat as far as that goes. I can't but laugh. I'm playing the, the liberal, so that's why, <laughs> here, that's why here, deadpan. Here is the slippery slope argument which is, okay, so um, George Washington owed slaves, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. You could kind of go, do we get rid of Mount Rushmore? Do we get rid of Monticello? Do we get rid of the White House? The White House was built in part by slave labor. This is the history of the country. And my concern in particular is that if you start to cave on this kind of stuff, say, well, we're gonna remove this, and we're gonna remove that. History shows, in particular, it never stops. It only continues to escalate because it emboldens people who want to scrub a country of its history. Um, and of course, the point is as well that when you allow people to start focusing on historical statues, what happens is it distracts them in many ways from the far more pressing issues that are going on uh, in the present in terms of race relations, in terms of you know black opportunity, in terms of black poverty, black crime rates, black illegitimacy, and so on. We want to have people focus on the present, pretending that the biggest issue facing minority communities is the presence of statues put up 120 years ago, I think is entirely uh, playing into the hands of people who want to distract 
productive solutions in the here and now. Well, I don't think I would disagree. There are certainly issues plaguing minorities that need to be addressed right now, namely right-wing racism. But let me use a slippery slope argument against you. If you say, well, it's a slippery slope to start taking these down, could I not say it's a slippery slope to allow these up? Why not stop? Why stop at the Confederacy? Uh, why not allow monuments if people feel comfortable with, uh, with fascists, with dictators, with people who could be a part of? We have step monuments that aren't necessarily exclusive to American history, but world history in our parks, in our federal parks across the country. What's to stop us from having a, a, a statue of Hitler or a statue of a, a, a kamikaze a bomber from World War II? The slippery slope could go both ways. Well, I mean, the slippery slope argument is fine unless you have well over a century of empirical data saying it's not happening, <laughs> right? I mean, we have these statues that were put up, and they were put up, of course, remember, after the Civil War, uh, what, 600,000 dead, uh, entire states half in ruins and on fire and starving. The statues were put up as a means of bringing unity back to a shattered and divided country. And the fact that people who want to further divide this country or divide America are now wanting to pull down these statues, I don't think is accidental. But in the time since, more and more of these statues have not been put up. Statues of uh, the Kaiser, uh, statues of Hitler, of Mussolini, of, of Chairman Mao, uh, I guess other than Lenin, the one in Seattle on private property, these have not been popping up. So the slippery slope argument uh, in terms of the destruction of history, we see that totalitarian regimes, totalitarian mindsets, mindsets are continually scrubbing history from a country. I mean, look at how ISIS goes into uh, a, a Christian uh, region and it destroys the churches and, and desecrates the, the uh, monuments and so on and, and the uh, crucifixion scenes. So this is very common. This happens all the time and never stops until all history is completely erased. So that slippery slope argument has lots of empirical data. The slippery slope argument in the other way, that next thing you know, there's going to be, you know, giant bat-winged Satans on, on the top of the Capitol. Actually, that might be appropriate at times. <laughs> but uh, the, the idea that the slippery slope argument is going to go the other way uh, doesn't seem to have any empirical data. And the second point, which is much more brief, Steve, is, uh, is, is this. I'll tell you this. Not a fan of Hitler. Not a fan of Mussolini. Not a fan of uh, Chairman Mao. But if there's a strong enough contingent in America that people are passing out the, um, the hat, they're getting donations, they're commissioning an artist, they're getting the public land, they're pushing it through uh, some sort of uh, committee, and let's say you end up with some giant statue of Mussolini. Yes, I know some people think I could pose for it, but if you end up with some big giant statue of Mussolini, I think that's kind of important information to know about the political leanings of those people in your country who are willing to go that far. If you shut it down, if you don't ever allow it, then the if there are growing Mussolini-loving fascists uh, in, in your neck of the woods, well, they're just going to meet underground and then you're not going to be able to keep track of them. It's kind of like a free speech issue. Um, a statue is kind of like a free speech frozen thing. It is not necessarily an endorsement. I mean, somebody could put up a statue of Hitler uh, which provokes discussion while being no fan of Hitler or Mussolini or anything like that. But uh, the question fundamentally comes down to the public space issue. Uh, if it's private property, then there's going to be much less disagreement. And, you know, in my opinion, in the West, there's far too much public property and far too much political uh, wranglings about this uh, kind of stuff. So the issue may go a lot deeper just in terms of how much uh, land and how many resources the government owns uh, versus it being in private hands where these kinds of issues are much less likely to arise. I see no need to continue an argument with a right-wing racist who says that he wants to erect a statue of Mussolini. I win the argument. <laughs> and pose. All right, that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> how did, how did, people can tweet me at S. Crowder, you at Stefan Molyneux. I don't know how I did. I was I was trying to find. I was again. It's I was trying to be con somewhat convincing. These are the arguments I would often run into. Right. No. And see, here's the thing too. We can have a productive discussion. You know, you had some great points. Uh, uh, evil Steve. Very evil. <laughs> Someone's gonna take that and mash it up. You know, to go. By the That's way, right. did you know that you Stephen have to put believes a this? On, you know, like the evil Kirk. <laughs> yeah. But. Um, no, I mean, see, we can have a very productive discussion just going back and forth. We can both illuminate each other's arguments. Of course, we can let the audience decide. But um, this is how things can work when you're not just out there taking offense and escalating and screaming at people. I mean, you can actually have a very productive discussion and both end up wiser. I mean, you brought up a bunch of points. Well, this was a surprise debate, which is great. Uh, I'm certainly no deep expert on, on the history. Yeah, of by the way, for people who are watching, that was just a surprise. I just picked one because it happens to be in the air right now. And I actually do think it's an issue with, with more nuance. And I think I think I think if I were to take a pro-abortion stance or something like that, you'd, you'd it'd be very easy for you. So I tried to pick one that might be complicated. 
No, and, and it's very timely. And so you, for me at least, you're always trying to extract from the immediate emotions and examples of the moment, you know, because the false equivalency or the, I guess the false argument is something like this. Well, if you defend the existence or the presence of statues of people who defended slavery, why you must be pro-slavery, right? And that right. of course is not the argument uh, at all. And uh, with philosophy, you do have to work very hard to extract the principles. Yeah. And if you extract the principles and you wouldn't like them applied to another situation, again, this is a Socratic argument, right? So Socrates was having a debate, I think it was with Alcibiades, and he said, uh, Alcibiades was putting forward the argument that the life of physical pleasure, the life of pleasure is just the very best life and everything else is just goofy and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And Socrates said, hey, man, you ever had a really, really bad itch and you can't get to it for whatever reason. And then you finally get to it. And it's like, oh, that's so good. Oh, there's yeah. a gift for you. Yeah. And, there you um, go. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a really, really great feeling. And he's like, well, yeah. And so Socrates says, OK, so basically a life spent perpetually scratching a perpetual itch would be the very best life. And, you know, right. that clearly is not very supportable. So if you can extract the principle, well, if you're offended by something, it should be banished from your sight. Well, clearly that, that is a very slippery slope. And so extracting the principle is really important rather than what about this statue and what about this statue and what about this neighborhood? I mean, you can't win that way any right. more than you can do science by looking at one bouncing ball all day. Well, I think, yeah, I think it's, a, I remember reading that, uh, again, not in college, we talked about Socrates briefly. And so I had a couple books on Socrates, actually from my, um, probably my, my, my my favorite one is from my father, uh, my grandfather-in-law who died. He actually fought in World War II. He was a mayor of, uh, of Bloomfield Township in um, in uh, in Michigan, and he had one that was specifically dealing with the pro-life issue, and it was written from the perspective of Socrates and an abortion doctor, Socrates and an abortion activist. And I thought it was a really good way to distill sort of the Socratic method by taking all different facets of voices of opposition, you know, a doctor, a, a, an activist, and it really did give me some insight there. I was going, why didn't I learn this in college? But, uh, but, but you're right. Right. Um, those principles really do matter. It's the same thing where you're talking about scratching an itch. You know, when people say, well, uh, you know, we can we can bring these these jobs back, shovel ready jobs through a stimulus package. Well, we we could employ more people if we force them to shovel with a spoon. Right. It, th that's certainly not something that could be, <laughs> as you say, supported logically. Same thing in Michigan. There are these trees. We call them up north trees. And they're basically sticks with little little bit. They're coniferous. So a little bit of needles at the top. And the reason for this is that this is one of the biggest uh, falsehoods that Americans believe. The, um, the New Deal, when you look during the Great Depression, all of these jobs, they just took people who weren't qualified to perform jobs and gave them tax dollars to perform jobs that were useless. And so they, we call them up north trees. And I only found this out about five years ago. It was just, they were jobs for people. Plant these trees, go up to the UP, go up to northern Michigan and plant these trees and then we'll pay you. And they had no idea how to stagger the trees. They didn't know where to place them so the roots grew in healthily. So you have these rows and rows of stick trees. And um, you can see it in real life. And sometimes it's very productive, I found, to point to concrete examples that people can observe today. Say, this is the principle. And hey, even if you go to Michigan, you'll see this. Do you think that's a good thing? And sometimes it forces them to answer it. And they go, well, yes, well, no. And then they melt like the guy in of the Lost Ark. Well, yeah, and I mean, regarding things like uh, minimum wage, I mean, the old argument is, well, wh why $15? Why not $1,500? Why not $15,000 an hour? And people at some point get that, well, that's just going to make people unemployable. Aha. Or, you know, you, you're debating with somebody about the minimum wage. You say, hey, what do you do? It's like, well, I'm a plumber. It's like, well, okay, I support a minimum wage, but only $500 an hour for plumbers. And <laughs> You know, only plum, only the person's like, well, actually that because, you know, most of the right. people who are debating minimum wage are not people who are going to be subject to those jobs. Another case is to say, well, what's wrong with government schools that someone comes out of 12 years of education only being worth eight dollars an hour? I mean, what the hell is what they mean? Not teaching people yeah. in school to make them economically productive. But the most fundamental final one is sorry, it's a violation of the non-aggression principle. If somebody wants to hire somebody else for eight bucks an hour and that other person is willing to work for that, that is called a voluntary transaction. And if you introduce a gun to that and say, you can only hire that person if you're gonna pay them $15 an hour, you've just initiated the use of force in the um, in the environment of a peaceful economic transaction that is immoral because the initiation of force is wrong. Absolutely, and that is a huge fundamental difference between free enterprise and socialism, fascism, communism, take your ism of the day, uh, which Google will undoubtedly never actually define as left-wing economics, by the way. I don't know if you know, if you
you Google fascism, says right wing, communism, socialism, no mention of left wing whatsoever. Um, but uh, Ooh, can we do two minutes on the label thing? Oh, OK, OK. You tell what, what do you mean on the label thing on the fascism? The label thing. See, okay. like earlier you were saying, well, right wing, this, and that and the other. And of course, you know, I, I confound and annoy everyone uh, when it comes to my political positions because, you know, try to reason from first principles. The philosopher sure. is always annoying because we evade and escape labels because reasoning from first principles is the key and you have this all the time or it's applied against you it's applied against people say far right extreme this and what they do is they create this category this is sophistry 101 you create a category call it you know flip it a gibbet whatever it is and then you just like throwing darts at a board you just attach right. negative words to that category, right? This negative word, nationalist, supremacist, ra whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens is you then attach that word to a person. Ooh, <laughs> look at that. And now all of the negative connotations associated with that category, they're now stuck to that person and they follow them around like herpes. And then you can just dismiss everything that person says. It's a wonderful trap and a setup to allow people to not evaluate arguments, to not evaluate positions, to not process the data of what someone's talking about. And that is fundamentally required because we're taught so badly in government schools, we're not taught how to evaluate an argument, but we still need to make decisions. So we're desperate, there's a huge market for these negative labels because people don't know how to evaluate someone's argument, but they still need to make a decision. So slander, unfortunately, is what rushes in when people have not been taught how to think. Yeah, well, the label for that right now is alt-right. Right. That's, right. That's, that's, yeah, all right. That's in a there. perfect one. Yeah. I mean, you have Milo, myself, Richard Spencer, Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro all get that same label. Even though Ben Shapiro and, and myself have been very, very active. Well, I will say this. The now, contingent no, and then philosophically. Sorry to interrupt you. Steve. No, go ahead. Philosophically, the correct label is Hunkasaurus. And, and people don't really understand how that manly, virile bucket is where you all need to be squished into. Well, I will say this. This is one issue, and that's why I say right-wing, I say conservative, I say constitutionalist, because there is certainly a portion of the alt-right where I've argued with these people, uh, where they've said, well, your constitution at this point, we need to, the constitution hasn't protected anything. It hasn't preserved anything. And I, I don't think that's mainstream necessarily alt-right. That is a wing of the alt-right, because listen, the fact that we're having this conversation right now, and we cannot have it in the UK, we cannot have it to the same degree in Canada. The fact that people are allowed to get a permit to, even if they're white nationalists or white supremacists or whatever, pick whatever the most offensive category is that day. The, 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 the group is irrelevant. I always argue that, again, if we're going to talk about principles, contextually it does matter where those principles come from. And as uh, a country, the United States, obviously the Constitution was a recognition of inalienable rights were not given to us by a government, but by God, a creator, which I think is respectable for people even who are atheist libertarians. They have to understand the main idea is it isn't given to you by the government. It's merely a pass-through entity. And that's where I've argued with people on certain, I, I don't know if you say certain portions, wings of the far alt-right with the far left, with Antifa, people who want to scrap the Constitution. If you do that, it's really difficult in the United States today anyway to argue from first principles. And um, so that's something that I've, I've definitely uh, taken upon myself in this program to express as important, that preservation of the Constitution, because Canada's a quagmire because they don't, they don't view it the same way. Well, I mean, if the Constitution hasn't protected anything, then why is what is colloquially called hate speech? I don't know how. And again, hate speech itself is just another one of these buckets. Yeah. It's a, yeah. You know, I mean, the emotions of someone, you know, I mean, do, do you think that the guys, uh, you know, marching through uh, France in, in 1944, 1945, I'm pretty sure they didn't like the Nazis, you know, and, right. and I think that there's a lot of people who were, myself included, pretty damn good that they didn't like the Nazis. And so the idea that you can attach a negative word like hate to something called speech, that's not an argument. But America, of course, still has, as a result of the First Amendment, hate speech is protected speech. Again, I don't even know what hate speech means. I've never heard Everyone a convincing argument for that it. somebody else hates. Yeah, right? I've never heard a convincing argument for hate speech. They, they always go to the argument, the straw man, of you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. That's a call to... And actually, you can yell fire in a crowded theater, depending on the context. If you're saying, hey, that... That chick's on fire. You might get written up by HR. That's different from saying fire, fire, everybody run, and you could cause someone to get injured by a call to 
action. It's the actionable offense there. I've never heard a convincing argument. If I were to have to take the other side with hate speech, I wouldn't be able to do it because I've never heard a convincing argument. I've never heard a convincing no, argument the, for hate the, the fire in the theater example, the problem is not that you're yelling fire in a theater. I mean, if I'm the only guy in a theater or maybe there's only one other guy, then maybe I've interrupted the movie theater. No one's no, the movie, no one's gotten hurt. The right. problem there is not that you're yelling fire at a crowded theater. The problem is that people are going to die. It's a consequentialist argument, right. which means that the hate aspect of it has nothing to do. I mean, if I scream, it's the old thing. If I scream some hateful statement in the middle of a forest and nobody hears, what does it matter? I mean, there's no content to the word hate, no intellectual content to the word hate. It's just a bucket to throw unpopular opinions in so people shy away from them. And the sad thing is, is that if, you, if you're facing someone who has really terrible and egregious and horrible opinions, you should want them to speak and show the world just how stupid they are and how bad their arguments are. And it should be about as easy as pushing over as Mike Tyson taking on a girl guide. So, I mean, the idea that you've got to have the government come in and call in an airstrike on somebody making a speech. Well, if you're that bad at rebutting it, you shouldn't call the government. You should call me. You should pick up a copy of The Art of the Argument. You should learn how to debate so that you can be more effective and take control of rebutting bad ideas uh, under your own uh, control. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good point. And we're not even to get into the idea of, of hate crimes. You know, murder doesn't need a footnote. That's one that's even a weaker argument. There is already a law in the book for that crime. Like you said, you're just adding some arbitrary term at that point, hate, to try and ascribe some kind of particularly insidious motive or intention that you could maybe tack another, tack another term on for. It really is silly. And it's something that a lot of people have taken at face value. Let me ask you a final question before we have to go here. Um, now, there are formidable debaters out there. There are people who are great at it, and there are people who are okay at it. Are great debaters born, or are they made? Is it like uh, you can train a boxer, but punchers are born? Do you think that, that yeah. people can become better for who they are, but uh, maybe there are certain limitations regardless of, of uh, uh, ability or sort of, I guess, sort of techniques that they're taught? Well, I, th I think it's like pretty much any skill. You know, there are certainly people who are born with a particular desire and ability. I mean, I first got into philosophy when I was 16, which is more years ago now than I perhaps get a count at the moment. But um, uh, so or it's like singing or it's like tennis. I mean, there are some people who may be sort of more naturally gifted, although if you look at people uh, like uh, Tiger Woods, I mean, he was what was on the Carson show uh, with his, his dad had strapped golf clubs to his hands when he was like two years old. I right. think the same thing was true of Andre Agassi, the, the uh, tennis player. His father was like, I'm going to make you a tennis player. And there's right. a couple of uh, female chess masters uh, whose father's like, well, I'm going to make you chess masters, and here's what you do. So I don't know how far natural talent really goes, but everyone can improve, and everybody needs to improve. I mean, as you know, it's one thing to have debates you know, face-to-face -face, uh, in, in your personal life or with somebody across a dinner table. You've got eye contact. You've got the you know, tone of voice. You've got all of that kind of stuff. On the internet, things get pretty crazy pretty quickly because there's, you know, 90% of our communication is nonverbal. And so if you are trying to have a debate online, you're trying to have a debate back and forth and so on, it's great because it's public and you can really get some, you've got time to consider your points and so on. But you really, really need to be better. We need to up our game as a society when it comes to debating because there's so many opportunities to engage in public debate on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, in comment sections, or on your own podcasts or shows. We need to get better because the stakes have never been higher in terms of where we go as a civilization to barbarity or to maintain or expand the freedoms that we have. But also the opportunities and examples of debating are so prevalent everywhere our verbal cues, our visual cues are diminished. We really have to return to first principles, build our arguments and our cases up gradually and patiently and in a listening way and recognize that everybody who participates in a rational debate, win or lose, everybody wins. Because, you know, if you'd beaten me in the last debate, I'd have come out with a better perspective. You know, it's like, right. you know, if I'm about to take the wrong medicine and you say, Steph, that's the wrong medicine, here's yeah. the right medicine, I should say, hey, thanks, man. I yeah. really, really appreciate that. And I think that's what we should be aiming for. Or you say, ah, it's a party at the hell's a difference, and you take it anyway. All right, the book is, hold it up for us one more time, The Art of the Debate. What's, I, I forgot. The Art of the Argument, Art Western <laughs> Civilization's Last Stand, and the website is artoftheargument.com, and uh, it's reasonably priced, it's entertaining, it's engaging, it's funny, uh, and your life and your mind will never be the same. And it could depend, and I can't believe I said Art of the Debate, because I kept using the word debate, artoftheargument.com. Stefan Molyneux, uh, like I said, everyone can certainly stand to gain from this. Thank you so much for being here, brother. People, we will Thanks, be back Steve. tomorrow. Oh, it's a great pleasure. I appreciate that. It only takes